Um, I just wanted to come up here uh, and introduce Doug Gabbert, um, uh, Deputy CTO of the DISA accounts for HPE. Um, at a high level, HPE is one of the most integrated partnerships we have across the board in both the ITOMS and applications ca uh, catalog as well as the diverse infrastructure, um, server infrastructures that you could take advantage of with their stack. Um, we're, we're very, we're, we're humbled by the partnership with HPE and I and Doug and I have been working together quite a lot on the DISA accounts, on certification processes and, uh, and he's here today to talk a little bit about those efforts and a new way to think about uh, FIP certification, certification of apps in these uh, secure environments. So thank you very much and please welcome Doug. Yeah. All right, uh, there we go. Am I turned on here? Yeah, all right, great. Uh, so yeah, so thanks everybody for coming. I uh, really want to talk about, obviously, what it says on the slide there, scaling and securing applications in your terms. So a real quick one about who am I. So first of all, uh, I'm the Deputy Chief Technologist, as, as Chris mentioned, for our DISA and DOD accounts uh, at HPE. So obviously I cover all of, all of DISA, uh, and also all the mainer ones like uh, JSP, uh, ITA, DCMA, things like that. Things that aren't large enough to have an actual account on their own, like, like Army, Air Force and Army. Uh, I'm a Docker champion for HPE. I uh, recently sort of got that title from, from my work with Chris and, and really appreciate that from HPE. Uh, I'm a software de developer originally, and I've sort of been drug into the world of how to handle hardware aspects. So looking at building storage, storage architecting, massive SANs and looking at the network layer. So I sort of have a, a wide scape of, of, of experience sort of looking at different aspects of architecture from writing bits to uh, actually getting the bits across the wire. Uh, and finally, that's me. If, if you want to reach out to me, douglasgebert.gebert.hp.com. So getting into what we want to talk about today. The first one, <clears throat> on-premise compute and storage with Burst, uh, both local and hybrid, right? So part of the mission from HPE has been to enable the hybrid IT philosophy and do it in a way that allows you to run compute locally in your own data centers, but at the cost or better than cloud itself, right? So bringing that aspect of ability to have, have, have monthly payments, have OPEX payments on your servers, on your storage, on your network, with that, that buffer to burst into and out of. Enabling rapid like cloud-like scaling with bare metal systems. So if you think about provisioning a bare metal system in your data center today, it takes 30 minutes to two hours. Right? I mean, it's a really long time. You use Pixie Boot or you do an install from, from a disk, use a WIM image or a Kickstart file mounted over an ISO, and it just takes a lot of time. So one of the things that we focused on as a part of this move to hybrid IT was how can we speed that up? How can we make it more effective? And so I'll get into that in a second, but we, we now can provision bare metal systems in around 15 seconds, right? A full OS image, operational, ready to run, booting, and, and ready to be joined to a VMware cluster or, or to a Docker Swarm cluster. Uh, cyber concerns limiting the adoption of cutting edge software in Fed DoD. This is probably why you guys all came here today. You know, we all know that we have, have issues in, in the Fed DoD space. When you have an application out there, like let's say Kibana, right, and you want to deploy that for your customer, you just want to use the open source version. Well, there's no CAC authentication built in that application. There's, there's no FIPS built in that application. So how do, you, how do you push that through for a government customer, right? Those are two of the major cyber concerns they're going to have. They're going to throw that up as a roadblock. So do you have to go purchase an F5? stick in front of it in order to get this through the, through the gates. Uh, we're going to talk about a few different ways of how we can get around that. And then specifically to that, to that point, implementing organizational security requirements at a Docker layer. Right? So today when you look at it, every single application you have has to have a specifically built CAC interface to it. Right? They need to implement on every single operating system a FIPS validated cryptogra cryptographic layer. But what if we could do that at an organizational function? What if we could use applications, use software from the open source community, from other vendors, and apply to that software our security controls, apply CAC authentication, apply FIPS, right? Be agnostic to those applications and enforce our security controls and let the vendors, the software developers, do what they do best, which is write really great code, and we'll manage the security concerns. So getting into uh, on-premise compute and storage with bursting, right? So one of the key things that we've been focused on as a part of, you might have seen all the HPE uh, spin mergers, right? We've been spinning out portions of the company, slimming down. But as an advantage of that, we've been keeping massive capital. So by the end of, of August, when we complete our final spin out of, of HP software, we're going to have about $15 billion in cash. Right? So we've been taking that cash, and we've been funneling it back into our financial services division in order to leverage the, the ability of what we call HPE flex capacity. And that's our ability to deliver on-premise compute, storage, and network at a monthly cost in, in some cases in VMware, we can do at an hourly cost 
that's extremely competitive with your cloud providers, right? So we can be at the cost and often cheaper than say an Amazon or a Google, but on-premise in your data center and still offer that ability to have burst in and out and pay for only what you use. So <clears throat> what you can see here is sort of the, the you, can, you can have a local buffer, you increase your capacity. When you're done using it, you decrease the capacity and you stop paying for it, right? We can do that on a monthly or an hourly basis. Since we're here talking about Docker, looking at what you can pay monthly for, you can pay for physical machines running as container nodes, virtual machines working as container nodes, and Docker and software supports all included. So the storage, the networking, the racks, and all the software, all included and bundled in a monthly price that then you only pay for what you use. And what does that really look like? So obviously on the left there, we have a, a dollars and then on the bottom time. And the orange line is traditionally what you would do in a, in a, a capital expenditure purchase, right? You buy a whole bunch of infrastructure for your needs. You get a year, two years out. You buy a whole nother huge block of infrastructure for your needs. But really, what are you using? You're using this dashed line, right? You bought a ton of infrastructure at first so that you could scale up to meet that capacity. And then once you get to that point, you're not gonna buy a bunch more infrastructure. So what you wanna do is you actually wanna pay for exactly what you're using. And that's what flex capacity is for. So with flex capacity, which is the black line there, we're able to match and monitor how much capacity you're using, increase the capacity on your data center floor, but still have you only pay for what you use. And you can see in the little burst categories we have here, that's where the cost savings are. So you burst into this excess capacity, you burst back out of it, and then you stop paying for it. And you only pay for, for your continuous steady state uh, uh, um, services. And so when you look at where the, the flex capacity savings are, it's everything between what would be capital expenditure and what you're actually using. And we can grow with you to any size. We can do a, a, a row in a data center. We can do a whole data center. We can do multiple data centers. And that's a part of our capabilities that we've come, we've become so cash flush, we can finance ourselves in this model to help our consumers achieve their, their goals of being more flexible. Getting into uh, enabling rapid cloud-like scaling with bare metal systems. So your traditional provisioning, as I mentioned, you know, you gotta, you gotta write a script, you gotta do an install, you install, you reboot, you pixie boot, you install some apps, you do that over and over again for every server, 30 minutes to two hours. And then, then you'll, it, especially as when you're throwing that many bits across the wire in those cases, the more you try to do, the slower it's going to go. So what HPE did with our Synergy, HPE Synergy system, is we, we created a new technology called Image Streamer. So Image Streamer is built in as a part of the hardware of HP Synergy. And what it enables you to do is define images, <coughs> as many images as you need to function, and then you can deploy that image to one, two, or all of the Synergy compute mod modules in that system. And when you do that, what it's doing inside of itself is it has a pre-installed sort of base configured, say, VMware host or Docker host, right? And then we go in, we mount that image, we create a snap, we make some of the, the initial changes we need to do, change the IP address, change the host name, and then we deploy it to a server. And we're not deploying an image, we're using boot from iSCSI to accomplish this. So all we're doing at that point is we've, we've essentially, once we've created that clone and made those changes, that image is ready to go. We can now boot. We mount it to the server and we say go. So we've skipped the entire process of provisioning. We didn't waste 30 minutes to two hours throwing bits across the wire. We've kept all this data inside of the chassis itself, and now we've booted the system, right? So about 15 seconds is about how long it takes, give or take. There's some additional things that'll happen, but around in that time, and then from that 15 second point, your image is now booting, right? So from the perspective of, say, VMware, you've configured it 15 seconds, it's now booting. It's gonna boot through the VMware process. If it has a terabyte of RAM, yes, you're gonna be sitting there for a few minutes while VMware looks at all of its RAM, but once that thing comes up, it's ready to be added to a cluster. It's ready to be operationalized and have VMs hosted on it. Same thing with a Docker server. You boot the Docker server in 15 seconds, it takes you know, maybe a minute or so to come up, and it's immediately ready to be added to Swarm. Right? So we're, we're really looking at taking the ability of the capabilities you have in cloud today to provision a VM and add it to Swarm and bring it to bare metal, bring it to the systems in your data center for any of those operating systems, Windows, Linux, VMware, Docker. Getting into the cyber concerns of limiting adoption of cutting edge software in DoD. So it's, it's, the, it's the major ones, right? It's, it's CAC, PIVX, 509 authentication in these applications, if, or they're not there at all. It's username and password oftentimes. 
or if they do implement some form of multi-factor authentication, it's something that the DOD or the Fed won't accept. Right? It's SMS, which is now declared by NIST to be unacceptable and not secure. Or it's, it's some other form of, of duo or something that's really, really great and forward thinking, but the government hasn't really caught up yet, right? They also have a huge loose use of cryptographic libraries without FIPS 40-2 validation. So this is obviously a huge investment from a, from a, a vendor perspective. HPE has taken it upon ourselves and our, and our Gen 10 infrastructure and our Gen 9 infrastructure to pursue this, right? To get one product, one cryptographic library through the FIPS 40-2 validation program, it's about $500,000, give or take. That's the cheap price if you're ready to go. That's per module and then you pay that probably every couple years when you do a major code update. So it's a huge investment to obtain. <clears throat> there are entities like OpenSSL and a few others out there that, that provide open source libraries that are FIPS and 40-2 validated on various platforms that the federal government can consume. And it, being able to take advantage of those is something that from a vendor perspective, almost everybody does, right? We use OpenSSL on our products and then we go get it revalidated. Dell does the same, a ton of other vendors do the same. But then when you look at where the new modern applications are going, when they're con being coded in Go, right? They're interfacing with now boring SSL all of those validations fall away. And so it's no longer meets the security concerns of the federal government and the DOD because it's not validated. And it's really important to have that validation because that validation is a third party independent test that says, hey, your entropy is done correctly, right? Doesn't matter what your library is, if your entropy is done wrong, your crypto is worthless. It might as well just be sending in, in plain text. Is your algorithm coded correctly? Does it actually meet the actual standards of, of CMVP of NIST? That's another really important aspect here. You know, we have a lot of really, really great cryptographic developers that live in, in the world that, that work on boring SSL and work on other things. But this validation aspect is, is something that the federal government sees as highly necessary because behind this is the fact that validating these algorithms, putting in the effort to, to put it out to community and, and determine which, which you know, AES, for example, is the new standard. They're doing that because they're looking at crypto from the perspective of protecting national secrets, right? AES 256, that's rated to protect uh, crypt, the, whatever it's been encrypted for without having, if they don't manage to get the key, for 40 years. That's the level that the government's looking at this on. Protecting data that could potentially fall into the hands of an adversary, that's encrypted, they don't have the key, preventing that adversary from breaking that data for 40 years. That's what the validation's about, right? That's why it's so rigorous, that's why it's so difficult. <clears throat> when you look at security hardening and documentation, of course, you know, SCAP and STIG and, and FISMA and NIST 853, you know, again, this is sort of another huge gap that we have. A lot of vendors invest uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in this aspect. That's a really difficult one. I could probably give a, an hour and a half conversation just on that. But it's, it's definitely something we're looking at. Docker's been doing great work around that front, working on open control, working on having SCAP settings already built in, CIS settings. And that's a really important aspect that, in general, we should push out through the rest of the industry because this kind of security, at least this last one, is extremely essential to everyone's best ability to have software out there. The better, the more secure, the more capable of the security of the software, the better it's built in, the batteries are included with security, the better off we all are. So getting into approaches to enabling CAC and FIPS. So what do we really need? We want a simple way from an organizational level to implement CAC, PIV, or multi-factor, right? We don't want to rely on all these various vendors of software to enable it for us, right? Because you're gonna have to go back and ask them how to do it. They're gonna ask, how does it work? What does your cert look like? Where do you store your, your UPN within your certificate? And let me go write a special version of my code just for that and it's only gonna work for you and it breaks everywhere else. We wanna do it in a way that we can reuse it. That the organization sets the control and then enforces that control programmatically. Looking at FIPS, same thing. We really want to look at it from the perspective of how do we agnostically enforce FIPS from 40-2 cryptography. If you go back to what it looked like with IPsec originally, when the government was sort of investing lots of dollars in IPsec, their original sort of dream was that every server would talk over an IPsec connection to every other server in the environment. But then you start looking at what it takes to implement that, right? Internet key exchange, pre-shared keys all over the place. As soon as you get past 100 servers, it becomes completely untenable. The, so the solution was never sort of meant for that. So we still have the situation where when the government wants to acquire a piece of software, that software has to have its crypto in itself FIPS validated. And then everybody else has to do the same thing. So we're sort of still in the same problem. We've just sort of pushed it down to the vendor. But what if we could get to a point where we could bring that back up to the organizational layer? What if we could just drop an application into a framework 
and turn on FIPS cryptography and be assured that that FIPS is validated, that the cryptograph is good, and we can, we can allow the traffic to pass between servers or potentially between clouds, and it's fully FIPS reported to encrypted. So why aren't these features on by default? CAC and PIV, from a from perspective of sort of the, the open source community, it's hard to, to implement, right? If you're just doing it with OpenSSL, you have to create a certificate authority, and then you gotta create a server cert, and you gotta create a client cert, and you gotta sign those, and you gotta get those distributed properly. And you do a lot of work, and from the perspective of most users, they wanna deploy an application, get it up and running, and start, start doing the work they need to do. Not, not all this, this, cri this crypto that gets in the way, not all the security that gets in the way. On FIPS, it's also sort of difficult to get set up and running right correctly. Right? Lots of people think, oh, I'm using OpenSSL, I'm, I'm FIPS compatible. Well, no, 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 no. You gotta use the FIPS object module, which is true of any, any FIPS validated cryptographic library. There's a specific version and a flag you have to turn on in order to enable FIPS mode, to turn off the ciphers that aren't FIPS enabled, to put the system, the module, into a state where it's doing its, its error checking and its health check. There's also a lot of fun FUD. I was actually doing some research on this and, and still seeing some form quotes in, in, in various places talking about how using FIPS is less secure. And this is, this is sort of like a meme almost that I've seen across various entities, uh, across server fault, across various forums where they talk about, you know, some government folks get onto a, a particular application and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm so and so on a contractor working for a DOD government entity, how, how would I go about enabling FIPS? And then what follows is a whole series of threads about how this is insecure. And a lot of it comes back to a lot of references to the dual EC DRBG, which, you know, if you sort of read back, the claim was the NSA sort of planted in a magic key, and uh, there's no real proof of that, but there's some math that sort of looks like it might be possible, but no one's actually found the magic key. So that was the problem, that's gone now, right? That's, that's already been, been thrown out by NIST. So we do have this sort of issue in the general community of the open source world that this, this modules are less secure, and we sort of need to think about how we, how we approach correcting that. And a lot of really good has come from the fact that we've, from a community aspect, HPE's been donating money to the Linux Foundation, other companies have, and OpenSSL is a part of the Linux Foundation now, right? They're being funded. And, uh, you know, Steve Marques, who, who runs the actual thing, he lives up here in Maryland, for a while there, he had said he's gonna drop OpenSSL from doing FIPS, because he's tired of it. Didn't have a sponsor, wasn't getting funding, wasn't worth his time, it was too difficult. Since he's been a part of the Linux Foundation, he's brought it back. You know, the government uses this, everybody uses this. Is there, there's a key aspect of having OpenSSL. It's a key community piece of software. Even the folks that don't use FIPS mode benefit from the fact this module goes through all these testing, right? It runs through 100 million uh, variants of, of, of entropy, and there's checking done to make sure that entropy is done correctly, that the entropy is secure. So there's lots and lots of other benefits that come out of these FIPS testing that the general community really doesn't see. So where are we today with CAC and FIPS, right? Sort of mentioned this, every application has a unique CAC PIV implementation. So every single application looks at it differently, you know, maybe interfaces with LDAP and AD, maybe it doesn't. You know, it doesn't really meet the security needs exactly, and everything, every time you wanna go implement one of these applications and interface it with a CAC or a PIV, it's unique. So then you gotta write up waivers for it for each application. And so you start off, you know, you have your application kitten, right, and then you have another application, chinchilla, it has its unique implementation, then you have another unicorn application comes along, and you know, this just keeps going and going and going. Um, and then you have Falcor, of course. I heard one laugh, so somebody got it. <clears throat> Where do we wanna be, though? Right? Where we want to be is we want to be able to put hosts out there, bare metal private cloud, on a cloud provider, run our applications on those hosts, have networks, have an ingress network, have application networks, right? Have a service, a generic service <coughs> that does CAC PIV multi factor, right? A standardized way that we as an organization, or the government as an organization, can say, I use this service. You know, I want to interface my applications with this particular service. And then anything I put behind it will be CAC and PIV protected. And of course, to establish links. And the key aspect is we want that, those links to be FIPS and 40 2 encrypted. We want every communication coming in the front door through our, through our CAC PIV gateway to be FIPS encrypted. And when it makes a transition over the network, whether it's in the same data center or going across data centers, we want that to be FIPS encrypted. And we want to be able to set it at this design layer. And then as we drop applications in, they just inherit the properties of our design layer. They're now CAC protected. They're now FIPS enabled, right? And then if they're doing crypto inside of themselves, even better. So how can Docker help us get us there? So the first one, I was doing some research on this one that I found kind of interesting. 
doesn't really meet all of our needs, but Envoy. Envoy is a service mesh uh, that was just sort of recently, seven months ago or so, released by Lyft. It's, it's highly interesting in the fact that they have a front-end load balancer that does L7. They can turn on a form of CAC authentication. It's not the kind we really need, but it's sort of looking there. And then the service mesh itself, when it talks from the front-end load balancer to the service endpoints, it can turn on TLS. And they have actually a, a change request in there to turn on mutual TLS. So this thing's starting to look sort of like a very interesting possibility uh, of where we want to be. They, they use boring SSL, which is a fork, right, of open SSL. So it lacks all of the FIPS certs. But it is, we know it's FIPSable because Samsung took boring SSL through the FIPS 40-2 process. So it's not very far away of, of where we want to be in terms of a generalized design. And it's deployable in Docker, although it re really would require some application mod modification to get it all up and running. A possibility for another example would be an Apache reverse proxy with S-Tunnel, right? Both of these things have, can use OpenSSL in FIPS mode, out of the box, we can turn it on. Apache reverse proxy obviously is, is one of the preeminent web servers out there. It has the capability in the config to do CAC authentication right out of the box, right? There's examples all over the web of how to do this. So if we put this as a Docker container, as a reverse proxy in front of an application, and then put S-Tunnel in each container, we've essentially wrappered the whole thing in a way that we've CAC protected our endpoints, and then we put mutual TLS with FIPS from 40-2 validated cryptography between each one of our services, right? So it doesn't matter what the service is communicating over, it's now essentially protected. And finally, one of the ways we can look at something is an Apache Risk proxy plus Docker encrypted overlay. Encrypted overlay has probably been production now for six or seven months, I think, now. And what's really interesting here is that this pulls it even further out of the container layer. If you look at this, this S-Tunnel or Envoy model, you've got to stick something inside the container alongside your application. So you've got to run multiple processes in there, which isn't bad, but it's, it's some more tweaking you have to do, right? More modules, more places where code is running and things like that, so updates get hard. But with Docker encrypted overlay, you turn that on the Docker layer, and then all the Docker nodes in the swarm talk over an encrypted UDP IPsec tunnel. Right, it throws packets out there, everybody shares a pre-shared key, and, and all the packets they send back and forth to each other are fully encrypted. The only problem there, of course, with, with Docker encrypted overlay, it has the right algorithms, but it's not FIPS encrypted, right? It's all written in Go. So there's some potential there for some, uh, some force from the industry to, to, to try to tell Docker something. So what does uh, Envoy and Docker look like? Uh, so uh, what we have here is there's a front Envoy container. It's an L7 load balancer. It can do our CAC processing for us at the front end. And the, the actual front end process, which does the load balancing, talks to the service processes, which reside potentially in any container that you want to have out there that needs to talk to the system. An advantage there is that you can, again, you turn on SSL at the front door, you turn on CAC authentication, and then you also tell it that, hey, I want you to talk only over TLS to all of these service endpoints. And the service endpoints at that point could be anywhere. They could be one in Azure, one in Amazon, one on local premise, and, and you've effectively created a wrapper around your applications to enforce CAC and enforce FIPS. So what does Apache plus uh, uh, reverse proxy plus last tunnel look like? So essentially sort of the same thing. So down here at the bottom, we're more sort of in the model uh, of what we're looking at. We have an ingress network. We have our Apache CAC PIV reverse proxy service, which is doing our CAC authentication. It's doing it properly. We know it works. It has FIPS and 40-2 validated cryptography. We then have that talking back into our S-Tunnel endpoints, which again, are doing mutual TLS authentication with FIPS validated cryptography. And then when those applications talk to each other, they're using S-Tunnel. So now we've, we've fully encrypted every all the application communication, and we've protected the front door. So finally, Apache reverse proxy plus Docker encrypted overlay. You can see now what we've done is we pulled the crypto layer out of the containers. Right? We don't have to modify those containers we get from, from Docker Hub or Docker Store. We placed the Apache reverse proxy at the front door. We now have got a simple CAC PIV authentication gateway. And we've turned on encryption at the Docker layer. So now we know that all encryption passing through the system is encrypted. Another interesting advantage of this is, well, what if I want to introspect on that traffic? Do I need to go get the crypto key and pull that out and store it somewhere else, potentially you know, making that a security threat? No. You can deploy another Docker container to pull traffic off the wire and send that wherever you need to, potentially over another encrypted overlay connection. Right? So lots of advantages to pulling the crypto layer out at a higher level. And it gets us more in line with where we really want to be in terms of, of running this as a service. So in summary, 
really what we focus on here. So again, flex capacity on premise, scalable capacity with bursting using OpEx funds, not your CapEx funds. Pay for what you use, right? HP Synergy provision bare metal at the speed of cloud. I don't, don't quote me the 15 seconds, I know it's on a slide, but it's right around that time. The cyber concerns, we, we chatted about the CACTIV and MFA, best forty dash two and security hardening. And then how do we mitigate those via Docker, right? Using that with a universal CACTIV MFA gateway and making our transport agnostic and applying FIPS at that layer, sort of the key aspects. So that's it for me. Uh, any questions from anybody, I guess? Now we got some extra time, right, Chris? It was an easy answer. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk to you in just one moment. Cool. Hey, man. I pre any other questions? What was the driver behind the first two uh, um, items that you had about uh, developing on-prem stuff to match the cloud when everybody's going towards the cloud? You know, your flex capacity and mm -hmm. synergy, what was the driver behind coming up with these? Yeah, so we, we started the, the flex capacity. We've been doing this model, so in my DISA accounts today, we've been doing this model for DISA since 2007, right? So DISA, through the processor capacity services contract, and there's two other ones, there's a, a, a communication services contract and a storage as a service contract. DISA acquires all of these compute network and storage resources, they pay for it on a monthly basis, and they can return it anytime they want. So it's a very much a utility model. So we've been doing that at DISA since 2007, um, obviously our, our, our hiring manager took notice of this, this capability that customers really wanted to have this OpEx model. And they started sort of deploying it throughout the, the EU uh, and, and the Asia Pacific region, and that's when sort of flex capacity was born as a commercial offering. And now we're starting to start to bring it back to a layer where we understand how the model works now. We sold it uh, pretty extensively across those regions, and now we're ready to look at it from a more broad space perspective of giving it now to the federal government and the DOD, right? Because really, when you looked at it, even back in 2007, even today, it's hard to convince most of these federal and DOD customers to move to an OpEx model, especially when they hear the, the, the worries of, uh, of the cloud, you know, like, oh, I left the instance running over the weekend, and now I have a million-dollar bill, you know, which is totally possible and, and, and uh, available if you, you, you leave something massive running. But putting that, that control back into the, the end user, making it capable of running in their data center, making it easily scalable and flexible, that what we've seen is, is that gives them an extra additional level of, of confidence and control over the data, over the servers that's in their data center. But it also puts them in a model where they're not so worried about this, this huge expenditure, right? I don't have to build for the tax season. I don't need a thousand servers dedicated to run just two months out of the year, right? I can burst up to that capacity and then scale back down to what I'm actually using the other nine months, 10 months of the year. Sure, yeah, absolutely, you do. Uh, but I mean, then, then you're, you're dropping all of your data into a location, and then what do you gotta pay to get that data back out? You pay fees. Was that, sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's for the benefit of everyone. Yeah, right. Um, so your, your bare metal, what, what is, is modular, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us what the hardware, what, what, what is the hardware? Uh, so in the in the Synergy frame, right, um, there are two slots on the on the left side when you're looking at the front. One of them contains what we call the composer. That's the management infrastructure that controls all the Synergy frame. It's essentially a chassis, a 10U chassis. Then uh, the image streamer is another uh, dual core uh, x86 server that runs an iSCSI boot from SAN system. That kind of drives in. Uh, it's it's got into SSDs inside of it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other any questions? Other, any other questions? No, I think we're good. Thank you, Doug. Yeah.